Uh, good, good morning, Journey of Faith. Um, can we all stand for the, for the call to worship? Um, I'm going to read from Psalm 100, 1 to 2. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, uh, thank you for helping us get past or get through this past week. Um, help us to know you are there for us no matter what we're going through in our lives. Help us to be joyful no matter our, the circumstances in our lives. Uh, for you are the source of our joy no matter our, of our circumstances, Lord. We know that you love us unconditionally. Um, help us today to be open to your message. Pray this in Jesus' name. As we wait upon the Lord, wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord, wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord. Our God, you reign forever. Our hope, our strong up on wings like eagles one two three lay my life to you where you were always there. Troubled times, it's you I see. I put you first, that's all I need. I humble all I am unto you. One way, Jesus, you're the only one that I can live for. One way, about so deeply within me you will never ever change yesterday today the same forever till forever meets no end one way jesus you're the only one that i could live for one way Jesus, you're the only one that I could live for. One way, Jesus, you're the only one that I could live for. One way, Jesus, you're the only one that I could live for. You are the way, the truth, and the life. We live by faith and not by sight for you. We're living all for you. You are the way, the truth, and the 
live by faith and not by sight for you. We're living all for you. You are the way, the truth, and the life. Live by faith and not by sight for you. We're living all for you. One way, Jesus, you're the only one that I could live for. One way, Jesus, you're the only one that I could live for. One way, Jesus, you're the only one that I could live for. One way, Jesus, you're the only one. My Jesus, I love Thee, I know Thou art mine, for Thee all the follies of sin I resign. My Gracious Redeemer, my Savior art Thou, if ever I love Thee, my Jesus, this Say with the glittering 
Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning because you are worthy of our praise and our worship. And it's by your hand and by your son's deeds that we are here today and we are saved. We ask that you bless our tithes and offerings and that you would use them to further your kingdom and that you would also use us that we could also further your kingdom. We ask for travel mercies for those that are away right now and those that are preparing to go on long trips. We also ask for just reassurance as these are some very uncertain times with world unrest, with problems here at home. We ask that you would be with us and that you would remind us each and every day that you are here and in the end, you are the only thing that matters. In your name we pray, amen. Before you sit, before anyone moves, anybody moves. <laughs> I'm going to dismiss the youth, but we're gonna do what we did last week. Say hi to someone that is not in the media eight seats around you, all right? Let us go. So today at 12, the youth group parents, uh, you guys will be meeting with Pastor Brian. Uh, he wants to go over just kind of uh, plans for next year and just give you an update, just connect with you more. Uh, let's see, this Tuesday, June 11th, yes, uh, we will be having our monthly prayer meeting via Zoom. Uh, please join us for that. There we go. I'm standing in the way, so... Uh, next Sunday is Father's Day. We're going to be having a potluck. Um, if you haven't been reached via email, uh, you can see Teresa about that. Um, there's no sign up or anything. It's just bring whatever you want. So if we end up with 10 or 20 desserts, uh, we are completely okay with that. We're not going to be mad. If we end up with all drinks, we're going to be okay with that. We're just, whatever you want to bring, bring it. If there's something that you want to make that you're like, I want to try this, do it. Someone's going to eat it. Uh, the following Saturday, the 22nd, uh, we'll have pool party at the Quans. Pastor Derek is smoking some burgers. It's delicious food. Time for fellowship. Kids can swim. And the children's dedication has been moved to the 23rd. Uh, that was the day that worked best for the parents that were dedicating their children. And the following weekend is Weekend to Remember. Uh, see Dan. Uh, he has gone out with the youth, but uh, it's a great time. Uh, marriage reinforcement and just really improving your marriage uh, through God. With that, I'm going to hand it over to Pastor Derek. I'm on. Yep. Good to have all of you here. Uh, wow, lots been happening. Uh, we already have almost 40 signed up for the pool party, so Kathy and I are getting ready for you all. I guess it may be up to 60, which is fine with us. I'm gonna pre-cook the burgers and smoke them and then have things like pineapple and bacon and cheese and tomatoes and lettuce. So whatever you want on your burger, we will have it ready for you. And then it's a pool party, so please bring your whole family, bring your friends even, we'd love to have uh, you all come on over and enjoy us at our house. And so that that's good. Let's see, what else? Oh, today we're having pulled pork sandwiches. So I got up a little extra early, and I think I made 16 pounds of pulled pork. And the crowd's a little bit low. <laughs> yeah, thank you. So get two burgers, each of you, okay? Uh, if you don't want the bun like me because of diabetes, you know, then do meat, whatever you want. We'd love to have you enjoy yourself today because if you don't eat it, I got to take it home and it's just not good for me, all right? I'd rather poison you guys with all the fat and stuff than me. But anyway, it's a great summer. Hope you're enjoying it. It's now officially turned hot 
you know, and, and my Wednesday, my daughters, or Tuesday, I think, my daughters and my wife just said, Dad, we want to get out of the heat. And I said, well, I can't. I got a lot to do. They go, okay, we're going to San Diego. So my family left for San Diego Wednesday, and they got back yesterday, and they left us all alone. And then they're going to go to East Coast to visit my sister-in-law this next week. So no Father's Day for me. Just me and my son are bacheloring, and that's cool. Um, but we're going to celebrate Father's Day tonight, so th- that's cool. But anyway, just uh, happy for all you dads. Hopefully we can enjoy that day together because it's the only day, maybe other than our birthday, that we're kings of the home, right? So enjoy it while you got it. All right, well, now when I look at my life, and maybe some of you, you're, you're not as old as me, but when we were kids, when I was a kid, before there was the internet and social media and online games, you know how we used to entertain ourselves? We would go outside and play. Yeah, no games, no media, no nothing. We would go outside and play. At times, me and my friends would get together and we would build a fort. And sometimes if we were industrious, we'd use plywood and lumber and build a fort. Other times we didn't have that kind of stuff. We just had these large refrigerator boxes that we taped together. And it reminds me of a story of some boys who did just that. They built one. And it became a very special place for them, a clubhouse where they could meet and talk about girls and play and fool around and just laugh. That's what we boys used to do. And as they thought long and hard about this clubhouse, they came up with rules. And they came up with one rule, and I thought it was a very, very perceptive rule. And it's this. Nobody act big. Nobody act small. Everybody act medium. Let's say it together. Nobody act big. Nobody act small. No. Are you guys still asleep? Nobody act medium. Okay? Everybody act medium. You know, I wish our political class, now I'm a political junkie, okay, I love this stuff, but you will never hear me from the pulpit, Facebook, anything, talking about politics. Because if I do, I will get caught in this where I will divide the people and some will hate me and some will love me. I don't want to do that. I wish we weren't like the political class that would live by this perspective because one side acts big and that forces the other to act small. But you know, when I thought about it, it's not just politics, friends. Frankly, all of us need to humbly treat each other with dignity and respect, holding others up as equal. But if you and I are honest, many times it's not the case. Because our pride causes us to act big. And in so doing, we relegate others by forcing ourselves up to act small. And when pride exists in our relationships, there is no medium. Pride hurts relationships. And by pride, I'm not talking about a healthy confidence, the kind that finds satisfaction in doing a job well done, and one that believes and confesses that the strength to do that comes from God, not ourselves. I'm not talking about that kind of pride. I'm talking about the one that doesn't emanate from a healthy self-esteem. Rather, I'm talking about that which comes from an excessive self-esteem. Humble pride Hurtful pride makes one think too highly of themselves. And so pride, we know, hurts relationships because we think so highly of ourselves that we have no regard for others. We don't have regard for their feelings. We don't have regard for their problems. We don't care because we're right. And why do I bring this all up? Because pride is the issue that we're going to be talking about this morning in the little book of Obadiah. And so this morning, we're going to start a new series. We just finished a series on the Psalms. And we're going to start a new one, which I've entitled One Hit Wonders. And and I call it that because the five books that we're going to be looking at from the Bible are all one chapter long. Um, But even though they're short, they all are very significant in their message. And you're going to find that because most of you have never read the one chapter books. And that's because you just kind of glossed over it. But there's a message for each one of us in how we deal with our lives. Before we continue on, let's ask the Holy Spirit to be our teacher. Father, I thank you for this time. And Lord, as we talk about your word and, and these very short books, Lord, that we would learn something from the book of Obadiah about pride. 
how it hurts our relationship with you and with others, and to humble ourselves before you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Obadiah is the only one chapter book in the Old Testament. The other four are located in the New Testament. And we already had a, a test, and, and Sister Amor is the one who won that big zucchini, right? Did you ever cook that one yet, Amor? Okay, good, good for her. That sucker made a lot of meals. Oh, it's, just, it's, it's big. But anyway, Obadiah is nestled at the end of the Old Testament, where we call them the minor prophets. They're not minor because... They're not significant. They're minor because they're shorter, okay? And, and specifically, Obadiah is nestled between Amos and Jonah. Now, many of you know Jonah. Most of you probably not read uh, Amos. And though it's the smallest book in the Old Testament, nevertheless, it deals with the greatest sin of all mankind. No, not murder. No, not adultery. Not even idolatry. What it deals with is the sin of pride. And so the book begins thusly. Obadiah chapter 1. In fact, when we have one chapter books, we don't go chapter one, because it's, you know, we just say Obadiah one and two, all right? There's your little secret right there. Look at what it says there at the beginning. The vision of Obadiah, this is what the sovereign Lord says about Edom. We have heard a message from the Lord. An envoy was sent to the nations to say, rise and let us go against her for battle. See, I will make you small among the nations. You will be utterly despised. See, Obadiah, a prophet called by God, is making a judgment against the nation Edom. Edom is the name given to the descendants of Esau. Esau was the older of two twin brothers, Jacob. They're the twin sons born to Isaac and Rebekah. And Isaac is the son of Abraham. Unfortunately, there was a problem in their family. Hopefully, it's not found in yours, especially, well, because you have more than one child. And the idea is the problem of favoritism. Favoritism. Isaac loved Esau, the firstborn red-haired macho hunter. But Rebekah loved uh, soft-spoken and gentle soul Jacob. Jacob loved to hang around the kitchen, Genesis tells us, and with his mother. But the problem began between the two brothers because Esau came in from going hunting, didn't catch anything, and he smelled, you know, the red stew. That's where he got his name, Red Edom. He smelled that, and he said, brother, give me that. And of course, Jacob loves hanging around the kitchen, right? He goes, no, not unless you sell me your birthright. And Esau, being dumb, says, what am I going to do? I'm going to starve to death. Okay, you got my birthright. And so that was the first issue. But the straw that broke the proverbial camel's back led Esau to have this immense grudge. Because then what did he do? Jacob deceived his father Isaac. And, and, and uh, Esau wanted to go out and get some game for his father. Well, Esau, uh, Jacob deceived him and, and made himself to be Esau. Jacob, yeah, Esau. And so he stole the birthright from Isaac. And when Esau came home, he was so angry. That meant he had all the privileges of firstborn. And in that culture, it's a big deal, okay? He thought, this is it. I'm holding this immense grudge against my brother. I'm going to kill him. And because the younger, Jacob, was weaker, instead of trying to fight him, he heeded his mother's advice and just basically fled. And so the relationship between the two nations that sprung forth from these brothers, Esau, Edom, and Israel, Jacob, have been strained ever since. And the reason why is this. Edom decided to act big. Edom wanted to make Israel small. And there would be no medium in this relationship. Because God prophesied that the older Esau would serve the younger Jacob, even though in that culture that wouldn't happen There was this grudge that happened, and he would protect Israel from Edom. And some of you might be saying to yourself, well, what did Edom do to deserve such a harsh treatment? What were the people of this nation like? Well, let's look at the character of Edom right now. It says in verses 3, and going down to 9, it says, The pride of your heart has deceived you, you who live in the clefts of the rock and make your home on the heights, you who say to yourself, who can bring me down to the ground? Verse 4, 
Though you soar like the eagle and make your nest among the stars, from there I will bring you down, declares the Lord. And then you drop down to verse 8, and it says, In that day, declares the Lord, I will I not destroy the wise men of Edom, men of understanding in the mountain of Esau. Your warriors, O Timon, will be terrified, and everyone in Esau's mountains will be cut down in the slaughter. You go back to verse 3, and, and God proclaims, the pride of your heart has deceived you. It's interesting that the Hebrew word for pride means uh, to boil up, to see. It gives us a vivid word picture of what pride is. When we do that, we boil up and inflate ourselves and place ourselves above others. And not only including others, but our pride puts us above God himself. And Obadiah continues that Eden's pride was self-deceptive. It's because unlike what they believed, they're not that great. Puff yourself up all you want, Edom, but guess what? I'm going to put a cover on you. In verse 4, God says to them, if, if, if though you soar like an eagle, I will bring you down. So this begs the question, of what were the Edomites proud? Well, the text that we just read gives us three aspects. Number one, and I want you to look into your own life to see if you can identify with any of these three aspects. Number one, pride in your position. Pride in their position, verse three. You see, geographically, the Edomites lived in the south of Palestine among the steep mountains. And those of us who went to Israel, uh, was it two years ago? Yeah, two years ago, We know what they're talking about. The Dead Sea, there's like mountains that reach up to 5,700 feet high. And that's where Edom was located, out of the reach of their enemies. And so they felt very secure. They would thumb their noses all those below and said, none of you can get to us. Or so they thought. There was one who could, one who was even higher than a 5,700 foot mountain, God himself. He says, I'm going to bring you down. So they were proud of their position. Secondly, they were pride, there was pride in their intelligence. Look at verse 8. In that day, declares the Lord, I will not destroy the wise men of Edom. Will I not destroy the wise men of Edom, men of understanding in the mountains of Esau? Note that this verse tells us that the Edomites thought that they were really smart, wise. And throughout the Old Testament, other passages allude to their superintelligence. For example, if you go to 1 Kings chapter 4, verse 30, it states that Solomon was greater and wiser than the men of the East. And since these were the men of the East, since the Bible declares that Solomon was the wisest in the world, compare them, well, they were pretty smart. They were very intelligent. And so the Edomites prided themselves on their position and on their smarts. But there's a third way. And tell me again if you can you know, identify with this. The final way is this, pride in their strength. Pride in their strength. Look at verse 9. Your warriors, O Timon, will be terrified, and everyone in Esau's mountain will be cut down in the slaughter. What's Timon? Timon was the capital of Edom, and it was in that mountainous northern sector we talked about. The mention of their warriors alludes to their military strength, to the great numbers of people and soldiers that Edom had. And they lived by that saying, you have strength in numbers. They had this vast army to protect them from hostile nations. But Obadiah declares that no amount of people, no amount of soldiers, no amount of weapons is going to protect you from God's judgment. God is going to bring you down. Now, that's Edom. But what about us? How do we relate to this? You know, Edom is not unique when it comes to God desiring to bring us down because that reverberates into the New Testament when Peter himself said this in 1 Peter 5, 5, God resists the humble. Sorry, strike that, reverse it. God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So let me ask you this, and I had to ask this of myself. What, what do we get puffed up about within ourselves? I mean, position, intelligence, strength, even net worth? 
I mean, are these things that you and I are proud of? And then it begs the question when I think about those things that we try to attain. Does God want us to have a good job? Yeah, of course. Does, does God want us to be educated? I think so. Does God want us to take care of ourselves and our families? Of course. The answer is yes to all of those things. The problem is, is that when you and I take that, all those things of which God gave us, and then kind of boast about it from ourselves, that's the problem. He gives us a job, he gives us the education, he gives us the physical strength, ability, the wealth, and instead of a blessing, we turn it into something to boast about. And worse yet, as we make ourselves big, we make others small. Because it's all about comparison, guys, right? It's not enough to be a good student. You have to be the best. Number one is the only acceptable rank. And I come from an Asian background, and I've been in Asian churches, and I've been around Asian families, and there are other people like this. But I mean, people striving for their kids to be number one is so ingrained. But here's the thing. One mother complained to me about that. She goes, there's another kid in my school who's number one. My daughter's number two. And I just remember thinking to myself, I said to her, well, so-and-so, she was a friend of mine, I said, there is only be one number one. Because everybody else is number two to number, in the case of Hamilton High, 999 to 1,000, okay? We don't think that way. All we strive for is to be the best. And what does Jesus say? Nobody act big, nobody act small, everybody act medium. Or take athletics, and you have to be the best. Because for you, winning is everything. It's not enough to play your best. The satisfaction comes from beating others. And I mean, I don't know what you think of Caitlin Clark, if you've heard about her Iowa, and and now first drafted in the WNBA. There's so many jokes about the WNBA, I'm not going to go there. But it's a big deal. She has put the WNBA on on the map. Why? Because she was the best. Scored more points than any other player, male or female, and everybody's watching her. Why? Because they want her to win. They want her to beat. They want athletics. That's what it's about. Nobody act big. Nobody acts small, everybody act medium. And so it's not good enough to be a good athlete, you have to be the best. For you, winning is everything. It's not enough to play the best. You have to win. Pride hurts people. And guess what? God won't stand for it. So let's look at what Edom did to incur the wrath of God. This is the charge against Edom starting with verse 10. He says this of Edom, because of the violence against your brother Jacob, you will be covered in shame. You will be destroyed forever. On the day you stood aloof while strangers carried off his wealth and foreigners entered the gates and cast lots for Jerusalem, you were like one of them. That's an indictment, friends. See, the Edomites were violent in how they treated their brother Israel. Okay, They all came from the same clan, the same people. And that was not only morally wrong, but it was physically brutal. And so when foreigners came in to invade Israel, Edom, rather than helping out their brother, just stood by passively and let destruction begin. And it wasn't, that wasn't the worst of it. When it ultimately came down to it, they later joined in the attack. Their wrong was that Rather than protect their brother, they join the enemies of their brother in tearing them apart. And you have, I, I have a a brother, a younger brother. We've been rivals ever since he was a kid. I I did better with him than, you know, streets and academically, but he was better than me in sports. I mean, he would just, from tennis, he would just play around with me. And we had a rivalry as, as a kid, but I'll tell you, when, and I've said this with people, we tease each other, it's ruthless, it's merciless, we cut each other down. But when it really comes down to it, my brother will always protect me in the end. And I will do the same for him. That's not what happened with Esau and Jacob. Blood is thicker than water. Well, it didn't happen with those two. 
He held a grudge. Esau held a grudge. Now let's look at the three ways that Esau betrayed his brother Jacob, Edom, Israel. Number one, he gloated. Look at that right there in verse 12. He says that you shouldn't look down on your brother in the day of his misfortune, nor rejoice over the people of Judah in the day of their destruction, nor boast so much in the day of their trouble. I don't know. Do you feel that way? Do you get that way? I don't feel good about myself until I see someone else being destroyed, being hurt. My enemy is losing, gloating. Number two, verse 13, stole. You should not march through the gates of my people on the day of their disaster, nor look down upon them in their calamity in the day of their disaster, nor seize their wealth in the day of their disaster. It's not enough. You know, I have good friends. Um, um, my best friend, Steve, his wife, um, their father passed away, and there's four daughters, right? And, and they have a pretty big estate. And you would think that, wow, big estate, everybody's happy and wants to share. No. I've seen this with so many families. I want more. I want more. I'll take more. In a sense, we steal from our brothers and sisters. Same here. Number three, showed no mercy. Verse 14. You should not wait at the crossroads to cut down their fugitives nor hand over their survivors in the day of their trouble. Proud people never show mercy. They take advantage of the weak. It's not enough to be big. By being big, that means I'm going to make you small. Why? Because it makes me feel even bigger. The proud person looks at the weaker person in front of them and seeks to dominate and overshadow them. And here's the thing. The most pathetic thing is the person who's proud doesn't even recognize that they're doing that. They don't recognize that even though they're big, there's someone behind them that's even bigger standing over them. God. His shadow is casting a judging glow on them. God does indeed judge the proud. And he does it with Edom. Let's talk about the judgment against Edom. Verses 15 and following. The day of the Lord is near for all nations. As you have done, Edom, it will be done to you. Your deeds will return upon your head. What this verse tells us is that God's punishment is just. God doesn't just punish to punish. He always does the right thing. And it just is, uh, and the Apostle Paul would later say in the New Testament, in the book of Galatians, right? The same thing. You reap what you sow. And so God is never unfair. He always gives us what we deserve. But listen, he will always thoroughly carry out to the fullest extent what you have wrought in your life. Maybe today, maybe this year, maybe at the judgment seat, but it will come. Not only that about the judgment, God's judgment is complete. If thieves came to you, if robbers in the night, oh, what a disaster awaits you, would they not steal only as much as they wanted? If grape pickers came to you, would they not leave a few grapes? But how, Esau, will you be ransacked? Your hidden treasures pillaged. Thieves, even thieves, leave something behind, right? I don't know why. My mind, you got to remember, I'm attention to I'm thinking of the Grinch stole Christmas, right? He went in and took everything and left not even a crumb for a mouse, right? But most people who take things leave something. God says, not so with my judgment. It's going to be thoroughly complete. Now you got a glimpse in how my mind thinks, okay? Not only that, your allies, not your enemies, your allies, your friends will turn against you. Look at verse 7. All your allies will force you to the border. Your friends will deceive and overpower you. Those who eat your bread will set a trap for you, but you will not detect it. You're not going to even see it. Perhaps the greatest thing you and I fear with regard to our relationships with the people around us is treachery, right? Those whom we most trust, we depend upon, the ones whom we most look up to deceive us and turn on us. And who's the greatest example of that? 
Judas to Jesus, one of his 12, one of his chosen, goes up to Jesus on that night and gives him what we call the Judas kiss, master. And that pointed out to the Roman soldiers who Jesus was. Now, treachery takes many forms, right? Friends who gossip about us, spouses who cheat, two-faced relatives, co-workers who stab you in the back. And if you have a proud spirit, expect that those whom you think are trustworthy, they may turn on you. Because a proud spirit is hard to put up with, even by those whom we think love us. Finally, there's going to be ultimate retribution. Look at verses 16 to 21. Just as you drank of my holy hill, so all the nations will drink continually. They will drink and drink and be as if they had never been. But on Mount Zion will be deliverance. It will be holy. And the house of Jacob will possess its inheritance. Verse 18. The house of Jacob will be a fire, and the house of Joseph a flame. The house of Esau will be stubble, and they will set it on fire and consume it. There will be no survivors from the house of Esau. The Lord has spoken. Verse 19, people from the Negev will occupy the mountains of Esau. People from the foothills will possess the land of the Philistines. They will occupy the fields of Ephraim and Samaria, and Benjamin will possess Gilead. And the company of the Israelite exiles who are in Canaan will possess the land as far as Zarephath. The exiles from Jerusalem who are in Zarephath will possess the towns in the Negev. And deliverers will go up to Mount Zion to govern the mountains of Esau. And the kingdom will be the Lord's. There's a lot of places and things going on here. And you know, we're planning to have a trip from the church to sponsor a trip to Israel next year. But I, I think 98% I'm going to postpone it to 2026. Because, you know, I, I really want everybody to be safe. But here's the deal. We who went two years ago, these places mean something to us. We remember them. We remember what he's talking about here. And I hope and trust that two years from now or whatever we go, you guys will feel the same thing. You will understand what the land of Israel and Palestine is all about. So what do we get from this passage the judgment is complete. God will bless Israel. He's going to punish Edom. And those who are oppressed will oppress the oppressor. And by the way, historically that happened. The Edomites were defeated by the Jewish Maccabeans in the second century BC. And gradually Edom was consumed by the house of Jacob until they completely lost their national identity and autonomy. They're no more. You cannot find Edomites. They're gone. For the proud, think about it. This is the worst that can happen to you. You cease to exist. Nobody will remember you. What we boast about in our greatness will eventually be forgotten. You're number one now. Who cares a year from now? Nobody cares. If you're here this morning and God has prompted your heart to making you aware of an error in your life that perhaps you have a self-inflated image, you, you need to deal with it now. Because if you don't deal with it now, you're going to hurt others by your arrogance. And maybe you're like me. I, I have a hard time seeing it, right? We're, we're blind. And you know why? You know what's good about this? One of the good things about having a wife or a spouse is they'll point it out to you, okay? <laughs> my wife, I think she's my greatest fan, but she's also my greatest person to say, you know, Derek, you need to like look at this. But if you can't see it, really realize that this is something. Because we're belittling others by our attitude. Pride is destructive, and all of us are susceptible to it. And I want to conclude with a being who was dealing with pride, a pride that turned out to be destructive. He was known as the morning star, the son of dawn. He was the most perfect creature ever created by God. In other words, he was the best of the best. Not only was he intelligent, he used his mind wisely doing the bidding of God, and so he pleased the creator. And in every way he was found to be blameless. 
He spoke with authority, and others followed him, every word, every command. And not only that, he was perfect in mind as well. And he was physically beautiful and was unsurpassed by anything or anyone that God had ever created. And scripture says that he was clothed with precious jewels and rubies and diamonds and emeralds. And so God and this servant of his had perfect communion. And that went on for a while. But something happened. That being became proud. Scripture says that his heart was lifted because of his beauty. It corrupted his wisdom by reason of his splendor. And rather than taking commands, he said to himself, you know what? I want to give commands. He began to think to himself, I can do a better job than God. In fact, I can become God. And he says, it says of him in Isaiah chapter 14, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds and I will make myself like the most high. God's response was immediate and final. He banished this creature from heaven, but he this creature rebelled and said, I'm going to take a third of my, of these followers of God. And here's the sad thing. So full of pride and hatred was this creature for God and his creation that rather fulfilling the assignment that he had to draw people to God, instead he resolved that his ultimate goal would to be destroy humanity by turning them away from God. All of you know who I'm talking about. His given name is Lucifer, or the morning star. His official title is Satan, or Satan, which means prosecuting attorney, because he accuses us before God. He is the devil. And his hellish pride has caused him to turn from God and to destroy those for whom Christ had redeemed. And God judges the proud. And guess what? God has already judged Satan. You say to yourself, well, is he in hell now? No, he's not. Jesus said, you are the prince of the world. He meant it. Satan right now is the prince of this world. He controls. You want to know why there's death and mayhem and disease and destruction and war? It's because Satan's in control. But he's not going to ultimately be in control. His sentence is sealed. His existence is determined already. He will be in eternal torment in the lake of fire, Gehenna. So if you're here this morning and you have an inflated self-esteem, if you're filled with pride, then you have a decision to make. You have two role models. One will be either Satan with his pride, or the other one is Jesus who knew no sin and died for us as willing to humble himself. He always listened to his father. Don't act big. Don't act small, act medium. Let's pray. With your heads bowed, your eyes closed, I can't help but think the Holy Spirit has touched some of us to say, you know what? I think I've hurt some people. You know what? I think I thought of some people as small and myself as big. Lord, would you humble me? Would you make me the man, woman of God that you want me to be? Help me to love others as you love me. Lord, would you help those who are praying that right now, confessing their sin and hopefully making a change? Because we know change only comes from you and the Holy Spirit. Would you do that for us right now, Lord? Bring to our remembrance a reminder of, the, of that way and help us to reconcile to our brother and sister, to reconcile to our kids, to our parents, to our spouse, to our friends, so that we can have what it is you want for us. We're going to trust you, Lord. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Derek. We all stand for the last song.
Savior, I come, quiet my soul, remember, redemption's hill, where your blood was spilled, for my ransom. Everything I once held deep, I count it all as lost. Lead me to the cross where your love poured out. Bring me to my knees, Lord, I lay me down. Rid me of myself, I belong to you. Lead me, lead me to the cross. You were as I tempted and tried. The Word became flesh for my sin and death. Now you're risen. Everything I once had I count it all. cross where your love poured out. Bring me to my knees, Lord, I lay me down. Bring me of myself, I belong to you. remain standing as we close with a benediction. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can come together in communion with one another. Help us, Lord. Lead us to the cross where, Jesus, you emptied yourself, not of your deity, but in humility of your pride and died for others. May we, in turn, die to each other, Lord, and lift each other up we're going to thank you for what you will accomplish. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a great day in the Lord. Please join us. Eat as much food as you want, because we've got to take it home if you don't eat it. All right? Thank you. <laughs>